So the other effort, now Ole Evernoot had his fine single cylinder engine um, due to reasons I don't want to explain at this video. He, he left the Evernoot company. He sold out his interest in that Evernoot company and uh, went on um, a holiday for a few years. He had a no-compete agreement that he couldn't enter the outboard industry for five years. Um, but Ole was a great designer and he couldn't shut his mind off completely, I'm sure, and um, started thinking about outboard motors probably in the later teens, probably about the same time Johnson was, you know, working with the motor wheel and they were thinking portable engines as well. So Ole already had a lot of experience in the outboard industry and really had a good idea for what an outboard, what he thinks an outboard motor should be. So in the late teens, he designs up a, a nice light twin outboard motor, lots of aluminum. Um, so that's the miniaturization is the aluminum, the fact that yeah. it's lighter. Yes, yeah, it's much. You're including lightness along with yes, miniaturization. So, yeah, okay. so the Evernood that was being made at the same time, this one here, a lot of cast iron, a lot of bronze, bronze cast iron. Right. Um, and um, Evernoo didn't want to make the change. They were quite content with this product. Ole comes along with this idea about a light twin outboard motor. Okay. And he really took in consideration back to his usability and comfort. And so he's got this outboard now it's aluminum, still open flywheel for starting, no mystery for starting. Okay. So it's, we got, we're talking about an all aluminum midsection, yeah, all aluminum, all aluminum yeah, lower unit. Below. So it's quite light for yep. its era, but look, it doesn't turn anymore. It doesn't turn, yeah. It doesn't turn at all. Right. And I, I really believe, and this is my opinion, Ole decided to go back into the outboard business with a very refined product. And he thought that um, having a fixed power head and rudder steering made it a very refined product because now you don't have to sit there and hold this tiller that's bouncing around and, and all that. You can go anywhere in the boat, okay, and steer, steer the boat in the comfort of your seat wherever you want to sit in the boat, as well as it had underwater exhaust so it was quiet. Wait a minute. Underwater exhaust, what was this, 1922? 20, these, this is um, a twenty, probably a 20, 24, 25. The, um, but it's very similar to the version that but Ole came didn't out Carl with Kikaver in 21. Didn't invent the underwater exhaust? Well, he thought in his own mind. Oh, I see. Okay. He, he probably thought about a lot of things in his own mind. But Evan Root never contested him on this, even in the 50s. For some reason, they gave up on this, right? Yeah, it it disappeared. Uh, in in twenty seven, the Eltos um, didn't have didn't have that feature anymore. Really, and, uh, and OMC gave up on that idea until Mercury reintroduced it. Reintroduced it with great success, by the way. Right. You know, so, why, yeah, why why would they give up on such a such an idea? I I have no idea, but you know things happen. Things happen in industry. People make decisions. Anyway, so all these, you know, great contribution was not, you know, towards miniaturization. It's not really that small an outboard. It's not tiny. But, but it's light. But it's light, easy to carry, yep. and, it, and, and it's three full horsepower, which performed quite well on, on boats of the, of the time. They, it they does. The engine well. does run well. And no, no, no well, taking away from that. Pretty fast and speed. Yeah. But only being the traditionalist, Stayed with a one-to-one -one drive. Really? So that's a one-to-one -one drive. It's a one-to-one -one drive, sure. And it's quarter-turn start. Quarter-turn start. So <laughs> he also, yeah. So Ole st stayed with his battery ignition. He liked, I guess, liked battery ignition. But in all fairness, you know, probably when he designed this thing in 1920, what what was he going to do for a magneto? Right? He probably didn't want to make a magneto himself. Right. right? And the only magnetos that were available, he, he would have to buy one from 
Warren Ripple, the quick action Magneto, or he'd have to buy one from Evernood. Right. So okay. he, he must have decided that, you know, he, he his engines would start easy. Yeah, with he hung on to it long. He hung on to that. it. He hung on to it real hard. That was his. Okay, cut. <laughs> so, so part of the Johnson's miniaturization is uh, dealing with uh, a good Magneto, and because they were associated with Quick Action Magneto Company. It was the perfect ma magneto for this uh, new Johnson light twin, lightweight outboard motor. And of course, part of that was they had to design a smaller magneto, like, like the motor wheel had a small magneto. The other quick action magnetos were used on singles and cobands, and they were quite large and quite heavy. So, so they came up with this. And the reason why I, I want to talk about this particular magneto is it's it's a quick action magneto off of probably early 22 Johnson but the significant feature are these two bosses and the earliest Johnson light twin magnetos have these bosses and they had some other features like that unused boss well it it, it turns out that I believe that this is a casting that would have been used for the motor wheel that would have had ignition, I mean, a lighting coil here. It would have really? the, the okay. spark coil. Yeah. It would also have a lighting coil for use on the bicycle for a really? night. Really? Very interesting. And, okay. Uh, yeah. So anyway. Okay. So, so right where you hear, yeah. miniaturization or whatever, this is what set, in my mind, what set Johnson apart for many, many years Absolutely. and made them extremely popular was the fact that this magneto worked. It worked under worked. any condition. Yes, right. Pretty much any and, condition. And, and not just work, but it worked well. It really started well. well. It was yes. a very hot spark produced. Mm -hmm. uh, um, the Evernude mag at the same time period wasn't as powerful. And uh, in fact, Evernude even offered um, a, um, a booster kit. You could buy actually a, like a battery booster kit that would you could run those. Um, at least start them on battery and run them on magneto once the engine was running. But those Evernude mags are notoriously weak, and they will run an engine fine. Um, they're not a very robust design. Most of the survivors today are, are, are dead. The, the coils don't work at all. Whereas for some reason, the Johnson coils today are really good, even almost 100 years, That's right. 100 years later, they still work good. And I think you tell a story about you dug one engine out of a, a I did. dump outside. That K35, right down there at the end of the line, right. that's the original magneto that's on that, and that magneto was buried outside for at least 10 years while I was in the service. I remember the engine sitting inside before I went off to, to Vietnam, and when I came back after going through college and everything, the condenser, in fact, is still original, yeah. and it tests out fine. It has no leakage, and it is yeah, up yeah. to snuff. Yeah, right. So, so it's a, pr a pretty amazing magneto, and uh, I think that uh, as as modern day collectors, we're we're enjoying how good these magnetos work because uh, a lot of our um, efforts to run these engines today are uh, always successful because of that. And uh, so, they do run very very well. Yeah, Johnsons do, yeah, no yeah. question about it. Okay, so the next major step in miniaturization now is the outboard called the Johnson Model J25. And looking at, at it, one could say, looking at it through modern eyes, okay, fine, it's a single, you know, it's a little single cylinder, no big deal, it's, uh, you know, it's, you know, like any other single cylinder it's engine. Got a can driven water pump. Yeah, there's it's nothing special, nothing, right? There's nothing special nothing. about this thing. It's just a single cylinder. Except it runs extremely well. <laughs> yeah, right. So, but, but the breakthrough, which is invisible when you look at the engine, is, is this. And this is, was unheard of in 1925. This, this level of uh, technology. The, the offset weights here. Yes, the counterbalancing the crankshaft. Pistons, which we okay. don't see on, on this. anything, right. 
Okay. Right. Very so this was this was totally unheard of. So what does and, that do? What do these weights do? Well, it balances internally balances the engine. So it, it balances the weight of this piston going up and down. Is that what it does? Yeah, it counteracts and, and, and the rod, the weight of the rod, and all that. So it counteracts yeah, the thrown just, weight of the yeah, rod and the piston sure. yeah, going up right, and down right. the bore. Yeah. And what does that mean as far as the engine running goes? It would run faster, capable of higher RPM. Yeah, but without what, detri detrimental shaking. What would I be impressed by if I had, let's say, an Evinrude or a Wisconsin, and then I had this? What would be the difference between the two engines? So you'd what? Say, you'd so say, what? It's, it's a newer wow. engine. It goes faster. You'd say, wow, it's faster than that, and it's lighter, and it doesn't shake. It doesn't shake. Right. You mean it doesn't want to rip the transom no, off the boat? No, not at all. And that's a biggie to me. Right. That was the most impressive thing yeah. that I noticed. Oh, sure. So, right. so the other thing that appears... It's smooth for a single-cylinder yeah. engine. It's yeah. remarkably smooth. Remarkably smooth. And that's because of these weights, right? Yep. That's all. Okay. And this is, if you took a chainsaw apart, a modern chainsaw today, or any modern little single-cylinder engine, lawnmower engine, they all have this. Yes. Right. And prior to Johnson's use of this, nobody had it. This is a major, major, and people don't realize how major a breakthrough that is. It's such a breakthrough that it opened the door for future um, Johnson projects, and, and it opened the door to the alternate twins. Ah, that, you mean the thing that they use for years and years, those over there? Yeah. Those Johnsons so, right up there? Right, so it opened the door for, for the success of those. Because ah, I've always heard that, that those were developed from the V45 on yeah. one side, but as you say, you need that counterbalance on an alternate firing twin. That was the big breakthrough, that and nobody knows breakthrough, about right. that. It okay. opened the door to future high-speed engine designs that, okay. that never uh, could happen before. So it's just fantastic, and the aluminum piston was also an unheard of in 1925. That lightened the weight up and yeah, the sure, need right. for a heavier counterbalance. Look at the, they were so concerned about weight. Look what they did to the connecting rod. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And this, really isn't, light. this isn't something that somebody just drilled with a hand drill. This Because I've had a few of these apart, and they're all like this with the lightning holes. Wow. So, you know, that was became like the ultimate high-speed, lightweight uh, engines. So that towards yes, miniaturization yes, because is. that yes, alternate firing twin is a big leap from right. this engine right here yeah. to that engine right there, which is actually a little bit more horsepower. It's, right. I think it's a couple more horsepower. From less cubic inches. But it's less, it's smaller. Right. Everything about it's smaller. Right. Okay. And I, I believe, and uh, Ole discovered that when he came out with the quad in 1928, Okay. You get more horsepower by dividing the impulses. And I, I'm having trouble explaining that. So these engines take one big gulp of, of fuel and one big gulp of exhaust because they both pistons go up and down at the same time. Right. If you divide that in two, 
you get a more efficient engine. So an alternate twin, and of course Mercury found, Kefer found that out, you know, early on with his, uh, you know, great uh, KFs and KGs and K whatever those, you know, you'll, you'll talk about that in a minute. But having an alternate twin means you need a, you can get by with a smaller carburetor. Is it possible huge carb. that the firing impulse could be aided to pull the second impulse out? Oh yeah. Oh, for sure. So, so that's that's why it yeah, is yeah, more yeah. efficient. Right. It actually the first impulse going down the exhaust tube would pull the second exhaust out. Right. If it was timed exactly. correctly. Exactly. Timed correctly. Okay. And right. that's why these opposed twins typically do terrible with underwater exhaust. You'll notice that the best ones always seem to be the most uh, best performance are ones with uh, above water exhaust because it's just too big a gulp. It's just a Huge amount of material being tried to push at once. Wow! Yeah. All right. So, so that was you know the, this this innovation really you know it, it's far reaching and it's uh, unsung. I had no idea yeah, that yeah, that was a big yeah, deal. Yeah. Because you say the early efforts were to weight the flywheels to counterbalance yeah, there's a, there's it some a, way. There's a yeah. There's, there's a, a there's a big lump on big that lump thing on somewhere. Big lump on the flywheel to try to. Right there. It's yeah, right on right. this side yeah. opposite the handle. Yeah, yeah you can see it. Yeah, you can see it down there. in there. Yeah, there it that is was, right there. Well, this, that thing is horrible in the back of a boat. I literally <laughs> thought I was going to lose my transom yeah, running. I've seen it. some like that. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Um, 1915, Wisconsin. Battery ignition. Rudder model. They came with a magneto and they came with no rudder if you wanted to order them. That you And this is a little deviant from miniaturization, but I also wanted to, while this is apart, talk about the lubrication system, which is another thing that it was unheard this of. This is the base? This is the bottom it of the crankcase. looks like case. a little catch basin right there. There is. There's a catch basin, basin and there's a, a passage there with a screen in it. Okay. Which goes to a fitting, and that has a tube that goes over to... Um, this place on the crankcase, and this tube goes over to the intake okay. by the carburetor. So it okay. pulls a vacuum on this whole system, which sucks the oil out of this area, okay, sucks it up into here, up into the main bearing, and through, you can't really see it, but okay. there's, there's Inside, passages. We'll say there are holes, yeah. access holes and passages. Lines up with a hole in the crankshaft. Oh, right there. Right there. Right and that hole, right there, that hole, yeah, the crankshaft. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's okay. Lines up 
with another hole, which is probably hard I don't know to if see. I can see it or not, but well, let me see. You hold it just steady. It's, it's. I think you can just barely make it out. Okay, yeah. it's a hole in the. Right. It's a passage that's drilled right. all the way through, right. straight through. Yeah. Okay. And that delivers oil to this center of the crankshaft, which just spews out and slings it onto slings the it rod. Onto the rod. And that's another. Okay. Another big breakthrough that it probably disappeared at some point. It was probably determined that it was too expensive. Those get expensive to do all that work. It, lubrication, and, uh, you know, it gets affects, very expensive. Yeah, because yeah, okay. that that engine right over there, that that thing, when they first came out with that, that had a forced oil lubrication system. Yes. It had, it had drilled holes in the connecting rod that lined up and fed. Right. There was a belief system that uh, early on that um, when you mix oil with gasoline, it ruins it. Okay. And they didn't really quite understand the um, how the oil um, maintains precipitates out of the gasoline in, in in a running engine. How it's attracted to the warm, the the heat of the um, rubbing parts flashes off the gasoline and leaves the oil behind. They didn't understand that back then. So they had grease fittings and drip oilers and all that stuff. 